Merhabalar. E, İTÜ AI Söyleşileri serisinde üçüncü söyleşimize hoş geldiniz. Ben Gözde Ünal, e, İTÜ Bilgisayar ve Bilişim Fakültesi öğretim üyesi. Merhabalar. E, İTÜ AI Söyleşileri serisinde üçüncü... Bugünkü e, konuğumuz Profesör Volkan Cevher. E, Volkan İsviçre'de İPFL'de öğretim üyesi. E, ben Volkan'ı hem geçmişte Bilkent Üniversitesi'ndeki öğrencilik yıllarından hem de Georgia Tech'te doktora yıllarından beri tanıyorum arkadaşım. Sonrasında da konferanslarda, işte bilimsel ortamlarda denk geldikçe görüştük. Hoş geldin Volkan. E, şu anda EPFL'de büyük bir labın var. E, sanıyorum bugün bize oradaki ekibinle yaptığınız AI ve makine öğrenmesi üzerine ilgi, ilgi çekici çalışmalardan bahsedeceksin. E, konuşman sonrasında ben e, YouTube chat kanalından gelen soruları sana aktaracağım. Sana sözü vermeden önce e, belirtmek istiyorum. E, seminerimiz İngilizce olacak. Sonrasında soruları Türkçe de alabiliriz, e, İngilizce de alabiliriz. Aslında tabii burada muhtemelen bir iki cümle İngilizce söylemek lazım. If there are any non-Turkish speakers, today's seminar will be in English. Therefore, stick with us. In a few minutes, uh, the seminar is switching to English. You can ask your questions in English at the YouTube chat window on the right. Ee, sözü sana bırakıyorum Volkan. Hem kendini tanıtırsın hem de konuşmana başlarsın. Heyecanla bekliyoruz. Teşekkürler Gözde. Davetiniz için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, bu konuda teknik bir konuşma e, Türkçe'de gerçekten yapamayacağım için İngilizce'ye e, geçeceğim ben de. Um, İngilizce için teşekkürler. So, what I'll do today um, is to give you basically a, a short summary of a longer talk. Um, uh, I understand that the idea is to give you guys a bit of a teaser and then we have some discussions, question and answer session which is as important as the talk itself. Um, so originally this talk was intended to be a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, uh, and threats talk. So I, I will do a subset of these, um, um, topics. And I would like to mention that this, this particular, um, analysis is due to my wife, who's also an E2, the, uh, triple E graduate. Um, um, I, I, I was asked to, to give a, a talk to some of the Swiss uh, CEOs and they, um, they asked me to give, prepare a general talk. And uh, she told me that, you know, I should do something like a, a, a business analysis type of talk. So you will see that the talk is actually quite broad. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, myself. Um, so this, this uh, is um, what I've been doing over the last few years as an associate professor. So my research is on machine learning optimization um, with signal processing applications, uh, information theory and statistics. I give courses on mathematics of data, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about this. Reinforcement learning, some advanced topics in machine learning and some data sciences. Um, so far, I've been lucky to have two ERC grants back to back. I have several uh, science foundation grants, some private grants, uh, some company, some US grants and a Google faculty research award. Uh, currently I have 14 PhDs and three postdocs. Um, and my group members have gone to academic positions. I have some faculty at Rice, Singapore National University, Umeo, Zhejiang, University of North Carolina, Min Ping and uh, lately um, uh, Technion. There's just a bunch of postdocs at ETH in Zurich, MIT, McGill, and uh, Turing. Uh, some of them to uh, company positions also. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in terms of teaching. Um, my teaching philosophy is, is that I, I'd like to talk about abstract concepts and then try to connect it with hands-on experience. So in terms of this course, uh, I've been giving a, a, this mathematics of data course. It's a bit of a tough course because it's, it's a bit more mathematical uh, that connects well with algorithms. Um, this year I'm updating it fully, which is taking basically a chunk of my summertime. Uh, there will be courses online, which I may also put on YouTube. Um, 
So the course talks about things like, you know, error models, neural networks, optimization formulations, um, statistical guarantees, and, you know, time data trade-offs, uh, things like this. Um, this last semester, I gave a course on reinforcement learning, which is becoming very popular. Um, this is this used to be in doubly in control theory. Uh, the computer science have turned it into a, a very interesting topic that maybe more computation orientation. Uh, there are still some interesting missing links between what the double E guys have been doing and what reinforcement learning is, uh, is currently achieving. I think it's a very interesting topic, uh, very timely. So um, I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, uh, we also organized like a campus-wide machine learning seminar, which uh, I'm leading the logistics of it. Uh, there's a bunch of people like Martin Yagi, Nicholas Flamerion, Ali Sayed, Neba Kievash, Roy Faltings, Pascal Fossard, and Bob Best. Uh, on this front, let me also do a bit of a plug-in for EPFL. Uh, EPFL has been doing quite well uh, lately in terms of machine learning. Um, if you look at the machine learning rankings in csrankings.org, you will see that we're, we're typically, you know, in the world uh, ranked very well. Uh, this basically just shows you the academic productivity in terms of number of publications. But what I would like to highlight is that by just looking at these names, you can see that there's a bit of a, a, a strong set of people uh, on campus, which, um, oh, which you can also uh, see in this nice web page that I prepared for, for the school. Um, and now that epfl.ch, you can see the people there, uh, some of the activities, and there's a new center for intelligence systems that also connect well with the machine learning research that are interesting. All right, now, so that's enough about me. Uh, so let's talk again about me, but research. Um, so what I'll do um, is, um, maybe it's a bit of a mood point to ask this or try to interact um, um, with the audience at this, but like what I would like to do is ask you the following question. So suppose I give you two Sudoku puzzles. Um, one is sparsely populated, the other one is, is quite dense, as you can see. Uh, I ask you which of these um, uh, Sudoku puzzles is easier. Right? Uh, the gut reaction is that the, the Sudoku puzzle that has the most numbers is easier because you can obviously see that the only number is missing is seven here, whereas completing this puzzle is a bit more difficult because you really need to do some work. Now, um, so this, this particular intuitive easiness actually does not translate well into data science problems because oftentimes more data we have, like in this the puzzle, the harder the problem becomes because uh, we know this, this uh, computational dogma that says that the, you know, the amount of work an algorithm has to do increases the, the amount, it's, its input size, which in this case would be the data, right? So it is very difficult to translate that you have to do less work while having more data is, is very difficult. Um, because what happens is that people that worry about generating the data um, is somewhat different from the people that set the learning goals in terms of like learning formulations, risk functions, and so on and so forth. And then there's again a separation in terms of uh, what people uh, do in terms of the computation, like the optimization. Optimization people like to take black box functions to optimize. And learning theory people just think about the sample complexity in terms of the formulations. And people who generate data are often people that, that has to pay quite a bit of money in terms of um, collecting the data or effort, time, and so on and so forth. And the current paradigm is that, you know, you collect all of these data and there's a bit of an intellectual deficiency in the sense that um, you collect the data, you have too much data, and then you basically say, okay, I'm going to compress it. So you go from something like this to something like this, saying that these two are equivalent, and it is a bit of a mismatch in the sense that why go all this work to collect this data only to throw away some of the data afterwards? You know? So my research has been to, to unify these aspects and my group size is, is, is large enough to be able to do this holistic approach in how we generate data, you know, how we sample, 
how we set up our learning formulations and how we do these optimization of these learning formulations together so that you can actually trade off time data in terms of, let's say you have more data, you can make the optimization easier and get the solution faster. Now, uh, the, the second question I have is, I think so many of you may know, um, so here are some uh, images, some of them are computer generated. And the question is, is there some real person in this picture? Now, the, the, I mean, because I don't have the feedback, I will just tell you the answer right away. There is none. It's all of these are computer generated. And this is actually amazing. This is, this is somewhat, of, so this is a classical density estimation problem. So if you think about it, there are classical problems like migration problems, there are classification decision problems, and then there is distribution learning or density estimation problems. And here, the computer is able to generate faces where it learns from some of these samples that come in, right? And the procedure is, is, has been typically the, the, the following, right? So you set up some sort of an optimization formulation. You're given some data points. And what you do is you try to optimize your model given um, data points. You use things like, you know, gradient descent. You make progress and you try to fit your data. And the, as complicated as these images look like, right, what, what people in academia like to do was to think about simple models, convex functions that we can find, uh, let's say we can, if you find the local minimum, it's the global minimum, right? And in academia, we kind of look like this, you know, like we start with the motivation, like let's generate these kind of pictures, and then you try to set up a mathematical formulation, and all of a sudden you come up with a theory that is like as far away from uh, what you started with as possible while somewhat abstractly representing it. And um, my latest research has been also in this, this realm, getting out of our comfort zone in academia where we talk about things like nonlinear models, complex models, and non-comex landscapes, which are very difficult to optimize. Now, in this, in this setting, I would like to highlight something very important. I think, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here because this is the AI talks. Um, so here, um, if you think about it, what you need is, let's say you're given some data, you set up some sort of a risk function, and you need a model that will fit this this function that will be also as close to whatever a hypothetical true function can be, right? So let's say your real function is something like this, which is very ugly. Um, it turns out that, you know, you can use neural networks to, to learn any such function, right? Uh, as long as um, you have um, um, enough width, right? So by a, a neural network, what I mean is the, the following setup. A simple hidden layer neural network maybe would start from here. You would have an input that would go to an affine transformation. Then you would have, the, so after the affine transformation, you would go to a nonlinearity, which is a non polynomial function. And then you would collect all of these things and you would have, for example, a single output. If you put multiple hidden layers, this is called a multi layer neural network. And this, this was very interesting, you know, like um, people had been talking about neural networks for a while as universal approximants, but uh, to be able to approximate any functions, you need very large widths, which come with challenges, like this, you have a huge degrees of freedom, um, for which you need a huge amount of data, and the optimization landscape that you would get is actually non-convex, so finding a minimum of this is also very, very difficult. And that even if you could do something, right, the computation is not there because you have extremely large models and um, extremely difficult optimization landscapes. Now, we now understand a little bit more as to what these things are. Uh, with one of my PhD students, we've been looking at this problem, trying to understand the oral parameterization. There's very interesting works on this. It turns out that some of these things are not let's say, uh, can be handled by just thinking about algorithms or architectures themselves, things need to, again, come holistically together. You need to think about what the network architecture should be. You need to think about what the algorithm needs to be. 
And even the initialization of the neural network makes a big, big difference in terms of, for example, making the optimization landscape a bit better, starting from a point and going to its global minimum, let's say zero, um, zero data error. Yeah. Things, things like this are interesting to me. Now, neural networks had great success, but it also comes with additional challenges. For example, robustness is definitely one. Uh, so here is a turtle. Um, by adding some imperceptible perturbations, you can make this turtle look uh, like a rifle to a neural network classifier. Uh, you might think this is fine, but you know there's a reason when, when they tell you, for example, to keep your hands on the steering wheel, you should, because you know some engineers show that by putting stickers into some stop signs, you can actually make vehicles fail, uh, the vision systems fail, and um, it is it is really really um, um, disheartening, almost, um, um, to see that by by something so tiny you can change the decision uh, rapidly. Uh, this is a very active uh, research area, but uh, I have some bad news. I mean, uh, so here, I think the, so you, you, at the sale examples where you put these carefully injected, for example, noise perturbations that screw up your decisions are, are, are more or less inevitable. And you can explain this with a simple example of classification. So here is just a simple problem. So let's say we have a neural network that classifies cats versus dogs. Um, so let's think about this as if it's a two-dimensional example. So let's say this dotted line is the decision boundary, right? And um, if you think about it, you change the decision by adding, let's say, some epsilon perturbation. That means that, you know, if there are some data points here, you add a bit of perturbation, your, um, after your perturbed uh, data point goes over the decision boundary. So whereas you were supposed to say a dog with a little bit of a perturbation, you say that as a cat. Right? Now, when you look at this, um, the picture is interesting in the sense that there's very little volume or area here as compared to the total area. So if you think about it, the data is distributed, let's say, uniformly across this, this disk. Um, there's only just a few data points that we can perturb. The rest of the data points are safe. Now, this is where we um, where we are fooled in the sense that there's something called the, the the blessing of dimensionality, which actually turns out to be the curse here. It turns out that if you take a high dimensional sphere and cut it uh, in the equator with an epsilon strip, it turns out that as the dimensions grow, most of the volume of the sphere actually concentrates around that disk, meaning most of the data points in this particular example will start to merge into this little tiny looking area. And people have been able to dem demonstrate this even numerically. And um, this is a bit of a disheartening uh, again. So here, the so-called Lipschitz constant of the neural network is important, meaning that if you, so if you take the, the input, you perturb it, it's some epsilon perturbation, right? The, you, can, you can think of, the, because epsilon is small, let's think about the first order Taylor series expansion. So the difference between what you, the perturbed output and the original output would be upper bounded by the norm of this, which is very small, and the norm of the gradient at, um, at the data point. Now, the supremum of this quantity, norm of the gradient, is known as the Lipschitz constant. And if this is now, if this number is big, meaning that you can actually make little perturbations and the, the, the output will be varying rap uh, rapidly uh, and radically. And that explains why, why some of these decisions are flipped. Now, Finding the Lipschitz constant for neural networks is empty hard, but you know this never prevented machine learning researchers to try to come up with some approximations. So on this front, people have been trying to come up with some ideas as to uh, coming up with methods that do not have current guarantees a prior, but a posteriori you can get like let's say an upper bound and a lower bound and see that they are somewhat close. So what we've been doing here was to to use things like um, um, polynomial optimization to, to characterize or come up with some approximations for the, the, the Lipschitz constant that goes from um, linear programming exercises to semi-definite programming, which goes from the Kriegen hierarchy to the Sarah hierarchy. 
And, you know, if you can characterize the Lipschitz constant, then you understand that its generalization basically is, is directly related to this, this particular number. And here you might say, hey, you know, um, this is good, uh, but aren't you again becoming like this academic that is a bit disconnected um, because, you know, we talk about semi-definite programming, it's not scalable. Unfortunately, my group has been working on optimization aspects that we actually came up with um, maybe currently the, the best complexity result for semi-definite programming that is also storage optimal. And that's like an additional, a whole talk, uh, which got the, the thesis distinction award for one of my students, I who's uh, currently at MIT as a postdoc. Uh, he's got a, a, an award on this, which is, which is very nice. Now, another challenge that I would like to, to highlight is the interpretability. And so, if you try to publish a paper in mathematical optimization, you can't do the following. You know, like you start with some expressions, and then you say it, then a miracle occurs, and then you have a result. Right? Now, neural networks are used for decisions quite a bit. And the if you compare it to the classical you know, models for, for classification, they get better accuracy, but their interpretability becomes a bit more difficult. And for humans that use this to make automated decisions, I mean, like there are all kinds of ethical problems, there are all kinds of hidden bias problems, there are all kinds of, let's say, legal problems that, that, that, that come with it because, you know, it, it makes a, a decision and that decision may be based on some perturbed input even where the decision could, could change radically. You need to have an ability to explain what's going on. This is a very active research area. Um, and what we've been doing was to, to come up with, um, let's say, certification um, uh, of the, the, the inputs. And we, what we try to do is come up with optimization algorithm formulations, as well as matching algorithms, which I've been mentioning a little bit, that gives you some bounding boxes and tell you, you know, let's say you have, um, you have a data point that will hit a decision boundary if you put like a bounding box like this. So you kind of understand um, you know, how close, which features, for example, are closer to the decision boundary, which might affect your decision. And that gives you a bit of an interpretability. Um, and here, as we work with these models, we, we also realize that they were robustly trained in a minimax fashion, uh, which I will also mention a little bit, uh, models tend to be uh, more interpretable, which, which is interesting, to say the least. So we, we apply these things to a variety of applications. This is something that we did for the company Zeiss. They're interested in retinopathy images and trying to understand, for example, whether or not there is a retinopathy this disease in the, in the eye. And by using these robustly trained models and some of our ideas, we can, we can identify where the decisions can be attributed to which helps with, uh, for example, people that are doing the diagnostics and maybe additional classification or uh, decision algorithms downstream in the pipeline. Uh, another challenge to, to neural networks is, of course, the reproducibility. And this is actually a major issue in the sense that, you know, like you have a variety of papers that show impressive results and you, are, you get very excited about these results and then you try to apply the same thing to your own problem and somehow it just doesn't work. Or for things like reinforcement learning, you see some performance on some, let's say, even standard benchmark. You just implement the algorithm yourself, you try, it just doesn't work. And then you understand that maybe your authors run 100 tests and picked up a couple of the ones that kind of work with randomness. And here there's an issue, and this issue is actually um, uh, quite funny. The first time I heard about this was, I think, Stefano Sato. Um, it's called graduate student descent. You, know? you see this model that, that excites you, you do it on you do it yourself to see if it works for your problem. It doesn't, then what do you do? You do what is called as graduate student descent. You put more graduate students on it, then the graduate students start tuning the algorithm, tuning the initialization, tuning the architecture until it works. Right? And to me, this is this is just terrible. I think I'm completely against this kind of an approach, uh, which which is not the proper way to do science. Right? Uh, one of the the challenge for for reproducibility is non convexity of course. Right? So which, which is something that I I, I choose to highlight in this particular uh, talk. 
Um, um, so oftentimes these problems are non-comics, meaning that if you find even, like you can certify that you're at the optimum point, moreover, even if you are, you don't know if it is global, right? For convexity, this is, I mean, this is much more different. Um, so on this front, what we've been doing was to develop algorithms for non-convex minimization with non-linear constraints. And we've been, we've been developing some algorithms from the, the Lagrangian perspective, trying to understand, let's say, the quant uh, quantification conditions, things like Mangaskaran and Promovitz, which we, for example, come up with and verify for some of the problems. Then, you know, you can, you can solve large-scale clustering problems with semi-definite like programming formulations. You can do adversarial uh, denoising, meaning that you suspect that there is somebody adding this noise by using generative adversarial networks, which I will mention a little bit. Um, you can try to denoise this so that the impact of this perturbations is small into your system. Or you can try to learn things like causality, which is again NP hard, but some of these formulations succeed, which is good. Um, okay. Um, all right, so I have a bit of an issue because I just realized that my battery is running uh, out. Um, okay, so I'll try to speed up. Um, so one of the, the, the important things here is, so what we've been doing was to come up with algorithms that perform without knowing too much about the optimization um, uh, assumptions. Right? So for this, we've been going uh, studying very hard with some of my Students Al, uh, Ali and Ahmed that we, we were looking at algorithms that, for example, give you the optimal rate without knowing the underlying structure with the idea uh, that you would like to come up with an algorithm to rule them all and what algorithm to bind them so that we can basically engineer this algorithm to a proper implementation and run it on variety of functions. Now, another challenge here is sustainability. Um, so if you think about it, the amount of data generated is significantly outpacing the computation. So if you think about it, you know, many problems will take longer to solve if you don't do something about this. And this is where I mentioned that it, it is important to understand how you generate data and how you set up your learning formulation and how you optimize these learning formulations. Uh, what we've been doing was to, to show that um, um, um, um, to show that uh, you can you can actually speed up algorithms when presented with more data, and we've been uh, developing, for example, analog to digital converters based on these ideas, and we developed things for magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, also, some joint collaboration with the Kent University. We developed some chips with uh, Professor Yusuf Ledebiji uh, at Sabanjir, and we're currently working with Gregoire Fourteen. And this, this is some of our preliminary work got an IBM thesis award for one of my students, uh, Cosimo, uh, who's currently a, a senior engineer at, at Pando Bus. And this is very interesting um, in the sense that if you think about it, analog to digital conversion, um, it's based on the Nyquist theory, which just does not care about what the data looks like. If the data is, lives on a manifold, you know, it, it may be. Um, it, it may be um, um, uh, a good model, but it just doesn't care. It just works with the Fourier spectrum. So if you try to, for example, uh, get neural uh, data, um, um, then uh, what happens is that, um, for example, if you just sample the data at 5 kilohertz, the analog digital converter works really well. But if you want to transmit it, it you consume quite a bit of energy. To reduce the, the transmission, what you can do is put a classical digital signal processing block. Um, in this case, it turns out that the compression block uh, generates a lot of uh, energy consumption. And what we've been doing is using these learning theoretic ideas and adaptivity to, to reduce these things and we basically build such a chip. And what we would like to do next is to use these kind of chips to transmit brain data to bypass things like spinal cord injuries. Okay, and here's the new chip by my student Arda. Um, uh, we also do this for magnetic resonance imaging to speed this up. Um, and we can drastically reduce the, the time in terms of sampling. And at this point, um, I'm going to 
I'm gonna uh, go a bit faster. Uh, we've been also thinking about you know resource constraint optimization because optimization algorithms often just care about let's say the, the number of steps to reduce. So here, uh, if you would like to let's say figure out the algae concentration in Zurich uh, Lake, you can take like an autonomous robot and try to move it around and take some samples. And there's a very interesting problem because what you want to do is, for example, find areas where there's a high algae concentration. And to be able to do this, um, you don't need to sample the whole area. You just need to find places where the algae concentration is above the threshold. And if you apply the standard approach, the algorithm will reduce the number of samples it takes, but it will not care how much, for example, the, the boat goes around. So it will move, let's say, so this is the depth, this is, let's say, a slice. Uh, it may go all of a sudden a kilometer to take another sample, which you don't want. And for this, uh, we developed some optimal methods with, with uh, Acaba bir kopma mı oldu? Okey. Volkan Hoca galiba düştü. Tekrar açıyorum Volkan'ı. Hmm. <gülüyor> I'm sorry I got this. Okay. It's okay Volkan. <gülüyor> you are in Switzerland and uh, we are having a... <gülüyor> no, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's, uh, I did not realize that when, when you have the presentation and the video, the battery goes down super fast. Okay, sure, sure, no problem. Uh, it, there, you know, it was it was eighty percent, and it, it basically died down so quickly that I, I, I. I sure, you can share it now again. Sorry, just. Now. Okay, I'm sharing it now. Just a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I apologize for the. No viewers. problem. Do you have YouTube open somewhere? Uh, I'm hearing an echo. Think, so I was used, I, I I am I am presenting from my Safari browser, but I think my Chrome is also yeah. open, so yeah. it's basically yeah. sucking up all the battery. Okay, all right. I, I I was not expecting it. It was 80% battery, and all of a sudden, it is basically a. Uh, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Maybe we can this. wrap up in like 10 minutes or so. No, no, or five minutes, minutes, five minutes, ten. Minutes, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's get back to this original, you know, uh, puzzling question. Right. So, so here is is is are these images that are generated by a, a neural network. Right, so this, this is again related to this fundamental problem of density estimation, which is one of the three pillars, right? Regression, classification, and density estimation. So generative adversarial networks is a way of uh, parameterizing density to be able to generate samples. And you can try to model very complicated uh, densities that has real applications, such as image generation, right? And when you see these things in action, it's impressive, right? So like, so some of my collaborators or some of my friends, Mario Lucic, who's done phenomenal work on this topic, um, it, just, it just looks amazing. The computer basically takes in a random, so this is during training, takes in a random seed, and based on the seed, it generates an owl or a dog or a, a fish. But these density estimation problems uh, lead to what is called as minimax problems. Um, and minimax problems are difficult. Um, um, so like you see some of these examples that, that work for GANs, generative adversarial networks, but there are many that doesn't work. So there's like a major question as to how to make GAN training work. And what we've been looking was to look at this problem from a, let's say, a basic theory perspective, and we've been able to show that there are some issues in non-convex, non-concave problem, the existence of these internally chained transitive states where algorithms, for example, would never go to the optimal minimax point. They would just cycle around and you wouldn't even know. And this is, we've been able to prove this, this fact for a variety of common algorithms like gradient descent, percent, and so on and so forth. And what is interesting is that oftentimes they would also go to a maximum point. And because this is not a by a fine uh, problem, this is also not good. And you wouldn't know. 
So the, the, the scan problems are, are very difficult. So in this problem, what we've been doing was to, to let's say, look at something like a, a mixed Nash equilibrium idea. So if you think about it in the min-max case, this is like a, a, a game theoretic problem where you have two adversaries against each other. And if you choose like one parameter for each adversary, this is called a pure Nash. But we know that pure Nash doesn't work in general in the sense that um, um, if you're playing rock, paper, scissors in training time, if, if you're playing rock, paper, scissors, if you just uh, see rock in training time, then in runtime, your opponent of, um, uh, will play accordingly. You know, like it's not going to just fix a parameter. So randomizing this is important. So we lift the problem into some high dimensions, make the problem convex, and use things like Langevin dynamics kind of idea to find minimax points um, uh, under certain conditions. And this, this we, we show that it works well, and you can actually use it in, in, in uh, generating things like hotel room pictures. Uh, this is idea, you know, applications and things like reinforcement learning, where we show that such robustly trained models tend to be um, uh, generalized better to mismatches in friction, in mass, and so on and so forth. I think due to time, I'm going to continue a bit faster. And in general, we do optimization and robust machine learning, where you know, like things like Gaussian process optimization, we have uh, some work. Um, now, GANs also give you an interesting opportunity. For example, in MRI, what you can do is, as opposed to coming up with a single image, you try to learn the posterior distribution and then go back and try to design your sampling to minimize the uncertainty. And we made this fast enough that the reconstruction stayed in uh, four milliseconds or so, so that you can, in, in real time, you can actually adapt your sampling in an MRI machine to improve your sampling. And um, so these ideas, you can show that it gives you very nice uncertainty estimates. And I think due to time, maybe we can get back to this in, in um, um, questions uh, session. There are some opportunities in reinforcement learning where you learn from human experience. This is very important. For example, if you think about the DeepMind example, they learn from the existing place. And this is what is called as the most important learning. And there are some things that we are doing on this round as well. There are many new opportunities. I think because of the time, we'll, we'll, we'll um, go a bit faster. Um, it's interesting that machine learning also gives you um, some chances to publish in things that you would not think you would publish. For example, I have a quantum chemistry paper now where we talk about, for example, materials design, and we're following on this particular topic. And now we use things like inverse reinforcement learning to design circuits. For example, in Bilkent, I did a project with the Optimal Atalar, and the project was about you know making a, a optocoupler for an instrument, uh, optocoupler and an instrumentation of fire for an atomic force microscopy. And the circuit design part is a bit mind numbing to be honest with you. And what I want to do is basically automate this part so that we teach computers to, to design such circuits so that the students can focus on maybe higher level questions. And with that, I will end. I think that, you know, there are very interesting questions um, um, um, that are, that are, that are, that revolve around this machine learning and artificial intelligence that are important time, data, and power, and other trade offs. For me, what is important is a mathematical understanding so that, you know, we can think about you know, new opportunities, new challenges, also in teaching this topic, because there's a lot of hype there. And sometimes this hype is actually very counterproductive because people do what they already do and they just call it artificial intelligence. Uh, this misleads public quite a bit, which is very dangerous. Uh, this misleads funding agencies, which I think is also very dangerous. Uh, and I think for this, you know, I, I, I do what I do uh, continue. I, I'm interested in things like optimization. So I think that you know, it's a good idea. And I think hopefully uh, you like the, the talk. So I'll take questions. Çok teşekkürler Volkan. Türkçe'ye geçiyorum ben burada. Bu güzel seminerin için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Sorulara geçebiliriz. Ben birkaç soruyla başlayayım. Çalışmalarında hem literatüre teorik katkılar var bahsettin. Hem de gerçek problemlere uygulama da yapıyorsun. 
e, konuşmanda bahsettin. E, çoğu zaman aslında teorik çalışan akademisyenler uygulama tarafına uzak kalabiliyor. İşte bazen de tam tersi uygulama yapanlar teori e, tarafında bu kadar üretken olamıyor. Bunu başarmakta nasıl bir strateji veya yol izlediğini biraz genel bir soru sormak istedim. Bir de bununla bağlantılı bir şey daha soracağım. Hemen ikisini arka arkaya. Sen de bahsettin bu derin sinir ağ modellerinde hani optimize etmek için şu an kullandığımız objektif fonksiyonlar e, çok çok büyük uzaydalar ve çok çok non-convexler bunlar. Yine de bir şekilde yararlı sonuçlar elde ediyoruz. İşte e, sen de biliyorsun işte flat minimalardan bahsediyorlar konjonktürler değil mi? Sharp minimalar e, sen diyordun geçen. E, bunun yanında adversary ataklardan e, bahsettin. Hani e, çok basit bir şekilde bu networkler aslında kandırılabiliyor. Bunu ampirik olarak herhalde gösterebiliyoruz. Sence yani ne zaman güvenilir hale gelebilir bu AI ML çözümleri? Bunları dayanıklı bir şekilde e, sahaya geçirmek için ne tarafta ne yapmamız gerekiyor? Biraz çok genel sorular oldu ama bulmuşken seni sorayım dedim. <gülüyor> İlk önce şeye cevap vermek için düşün. Hani teori ve pratik arasındaki bağlantıyı kurma. Yani bu bu esasında oldukça zor bir problem. Çünkü yani teorik yapan, iş yapan insanların teorik bir şeyleri çok zor. Çünkü yani orada teorideki bir assumption'ın değişmesi teoriyi çok zorlaştırabiliyor. Um, bu ufak değişiklikler belki pratik, pratik çalışanlar için görünmüyor ama yani teorik için çok zor problemlere yol açabiliyor. Pratikçiler için de mesela yani execution çok önemli. Yani bir şeyi alıp çalıştırıp bunu yapabilmek, scale edebilmek ve sonuç alabilmek çok çok zor bir şey. Ve bunu da genelde teorikçiler daha şey görüyorlar. Yani hani tamam bunu yazdık olur gibi görüyorlar. Yani bu ikisini birleştirmenin yöntemi büyük grup gibi bir şeye sahip olmak benim yani dediğim gibi işte yani iki tane yersi oldu arka arkaya. İşte ETF'in koşulları iyi. İyi öğrenciler oluyor. O yüzden şey olabiliyor yani, yani bunu yapmak gerçekten zor. Hem teoriyi hem pratiği yapmak zor. O yüzden büyük gruplar genellikle bunu yapabiliyorlar. Hı hı. Çünkü gruptaki bazıları çok güzel pratik yapabiliyorlar. Bazıları çok iyi teorik oluyorlar ve yani grubun dinamine göre konuşmalar oluyor. İnsanlar yani diğerlerinin perspektifini anlıyorlar. Anladıkça da daha yani iterasyon yapıyorsun işte. Yani bu bu şekilde olabiliyor. Benim durumda belki bir şekilde. Evet, evet. evet. Yani bazı assumption'ları anlamak mesela önemli oluyor. Hı hı. Ee, mesela neural network'lerdeki bu step size, dropping step size iki var. Mesela ResNet şey yaparken teorik bir insana söylediğiniz zaman bunu bu nedir falan diyorsun. Hı hı. Ama işte oturup pratikçiyle konuşup olayı anlamaya başladığınız zaman şey diyorsun aa evet yani bazı assumption'larla belki işte klasik stokastik gradient'ta da normalde step size bir bölü kare kök iterasyonla şey azaltman lazım. Aa daha hızlı azaltmak belki daha iyi deyip onun teorisini anlamaya çalışıyorsun. Ondan sonra da ya da mesela bir algoritma yapıyorsun minimax için. Diyorsun ki Aa, bu reinforcement learning'e etkili olabiliyor. Ondan sonra oturup pratikçilerle konuşup reinforcement learning'e apply etmeye çalışıyorsun. Ya da robotları hareket ettirmeye çalışıyorsun. Bu yani çok şey e, yani efor gerektiren bir şey ve şey yani kolay, kolay değil. Ama işte şey hani multidisipliner diyorlar ya işte arkadaşlarınızla veya da tanıdıklarınızla yapabileceğiniz şeyler çok çok çok rewarding bir şey. Şimdi optimizasyon konusuna gelince bu yüksek e, e, boyutlu problemlerde. Şimdi bu, bu problem esasında hem açık hem kapalı. Şimdi e, bazı makaleler var bu overparametrization konusunda. Mesela Ludwig Schmidt bir arkadaş bu konuda yani insanları bayağı şeye çekti. Ben Rectin grubunda post taktı o zaman. Yani um, Onlar şey gösterdiler. Yani böyle bu teorideki hani simple model alırsak daha robust olur, daha güzel generalize eder problemlerine baktılar. Ne kadar uğur parametrize olursak o kadar daha güzel sonuç çıkıyor. Ondan sonra tabii bu hani pratikteki şey teoricileri tetikledi. Şeyi anlamaya başladık. Yani olay şey normalde 
modelin kapasitesi çok yüksek olduğu zaman elinizdeki data noktaların hepsini fit edebiliyorsunuz. Şimdi bu fit ederken sadece bunu bakarsanız bir şey anlamıyorsunuz. Ama bu fit etmenin yanında algoritma, mesela stochastic gradient descent, işte implicit regularization denen bir şey var. Yani şey, hani böyle minimum norm solution bulma triki var. Mesela stochastic gradient'ı alıp bir least square linear sistem problemi çözmeye çalışırsan, orada yaptığın çözüm normalde mesela underdetermined bile olabilir şeyin problemin. Yani birden fazla çözüm olabilir çünkü matrixin mesela null space'inden bir vektör alıp ekleyebilirsin yani böyle istediğin büyüklükte bir sonuç çıkartabilirsin. Ama stokastik gradient'i çalıştırırsan orada sanki şeyi çözüyor oluyorsun. Bu pseudo inverse solution'la çözüyor gibi oluyorsun. Yani minimize all to norm subject to this. E şimdi burada train ettiğin network matrikslerinde minimal norm solution'ı sadece stokastik gradient çalıştırarak bulabiliyorsan e bu da direkt zaten generalization'ı sana veriyor. Bir Ama bir şey fark ediyorsun. Stokastik gradient tabii de, te, kendi başına da yeterli değil. Tabii. tabii. Initialization yani. da gerekli. Yani initialization yapman gerekiyor. Initialization'ın şey de ne? Initialization'da başladığın noktadaki Jacobian'ın positive definite olmasını sağlayan. Yani böyle rastgele initialization yapıp. Ve bu da çok önemli. Mesela bu Xavier initialization, Hay initialization Hı. bu tür şeylerin yani insanlar denemeyle yapmışlar, nasıl yapmışlarsa sonradan bakıyorsun ki yani bu initialization'lar esasında seni öyle bir yerden başlatıyor ki sanki stochastic gradient descent convex bir problem çözüyor. Ve sıfır solution'a gidiyorsun. Ve şey yani öyle bir şey oluyor ki bir solution buluyorsun network matrixleri böyle güzel minimal normal şey yapıyor ve generalize ediyor. Yani bu tür şeylerin anlaması şey yani, yani orada çok şey ciddi bir regularizasyon yapıyor olabilir mi SGD? Zaten öyle. Evet canım, implicit regularization yani bu Nati Cerebro'nun Tabii. çok böyle bas bağıra bağıra anlattığı bir konu. Şey yani Tabii. implicit regularization deniyor. Aynen. Orada şey minimum norm solution'lara gidiyor implicitly. Bunu şeylerde de gösterebiliyorsun. Yani bizim yani biz de bu tür şeyleri gösterdik kendi makalemizde. <gülüyor> i̇şte çok... onun onun dışında da işte bu flat minima ve sharp minima arasındaki şeyler yani insanlar daha önce de konuşmuştuk popülasyon riski denen şeyleri minimize ettikleri için hı hı. eğer bulduğun minima geniş değilse ve eğer yani popülasyon riski yani elindeki datayla minimize ettiğin fonksiyonla gerçek fonksiyon arasındaki yani biraz mismatch varsa eğer fonksiyonlar genişse biraz mismatch çok kötü etkilemez senin performansını. Ama şart minima ise biraz mismatch çok buradan görünmüyor ama e, yani şey fonksiyonlar arasında e, şöyle esasında Hı-hı. Hı-hı. bu arada grubumu da şey yapmak istiyorum göstermek tamam. istiyorum. Tabi tabi. Um, şimdi ah evet mesela burada şimdi geniş bir minimum varsa. Perturb ettiğin zaman fonksiyonundaki düşümler daha az. Tamam Bu flat minimum. Ama sharp minimum varsa perturb ettiğin zaman daha fazla. Fakat bunları yani mesela Levent Sangün'le konuşursan yan lakımın öğrencisi şu an Facebook panelisti. O şey anlatıyor. Yani işte bir gözlem yapıyoruz. Ondan sonra başka bir gözlem yapıyoruz. Bunu tamamen Tersi. Mesela işte bu flat minimum üzerine makale çıktı. 2017'de Yoshia Benjo'ya şeyi çıkardı. Sharp minima generalizes better falan gibi bir makale çıkardı. <gülüyor> Olay tam anlamıyla çılgın çünkü yani tam anlamıyla çelişen şeyler. <gülüyor> Ve şey yani aradaki assumption hani fark diyorum ya teoricilerde çok fazla fark yaratan şey. Yani aradaki assumption'larındaki farkları anlamak gerekiyor. Yani bu tür şeyler <gülüyor> ya zaten sihirli değnek yok yani bir günde iki günde olmayacak ben de bakıyorum o şeye literatüre ufak networkler üzerinde zaten genelde yani değil mi birkaç layer üzerinden bakıyorlar ee, orada yaptıkları şeyler de teacher, teacher student network setupları onlar tamamen real detayla şey değiller <gülüyor> yani mesela um, Teacher Student Network dediğim şey şundan ibaret. Yani bir neural network oluşturuyorsunuz. 
online data generate edip başka bir neural network'ü çalışıyor. Sonra tabii, tabii. işte bu oluyor mu olmuyor falan. Tabii. Orada işte chart minimal, local minimal. Tabii. Ondan sonra da şey bütün minimallar connected konuşmaları çıkıyor falan. Evet Çok aynen. Uzunlar. Yani aynen. E, çok sağ Bakın. olun ayağım. Çok ufuk ötücü oldu yani. Ve gençler umuyorum izleyenler optimizasyonun hani matematiğin e, bu işleri incelemenin de önemli olduğunu hani ne anlattığının farkındasın. O önemli. Onu O, o mesajı en azından vermiş oldum. Çünkü söyleyebilecek tek cevap yok bu sorulara. Çok güzel. Ben bu arada biraz eğer bitirdi sen e, çok güzel açtın. Başka e, gelen soruları sorayım mı sana? İleteyim mi? Başlayalım mı ona? Olur. Tamam. Ee, from your İngilizce sormuşlar. Ee, from your perspective, what is the biggest technical challenge in modern ML? Do you think we are approaching the performance limits of current methods? Marsh. Şimdi, uh, şimdi performance limitler. Uh, ya technical challengeler çok fazla canım. Uh, yani dediğim gibi. ML dediğin zaman yani regression yapıyorsun. Yani mesela prediction problemleriyle ilgileniyorsun. <gülüyor> precision classification problemleriyle ilgileniyorsun. Density estimation problemleriyle ilgileniyorsun. Yani bunların her birinin böyle grandioz şeyleri, challenge'ları var zaten. <gülüyor> ee, bu arada İngilizce mi cevap vereyim yoksa Türkçe mi? Yok, nasıl istersen. Ee, acaba var mı audience'da şey, izleyicilerde ama Türkçe bence gayet iyi. Nasıl rahat edersen. Bununla ilgili bir devam eden soru var. Do you think current robustness guarantees we provide for RL are sufficient to implement them in real life scenarios? What so that, to close this gap? What can we do to close this gap? So this is exactly what one of my research veins is all about. So uh, I put particular emphasis on robust machine learning and robust reinforcement learning. So there, the idea is that you know you think you think about a, a, a, a an RL system that tries to learn, for example, a value function or a Q function for the state action pairs. Um, So these functions, if you don't have a model, so let's say you're t- thinking about the model free setting where there's not even a model, right? You're just crunching through examples. These things are already difficult to begin with, right? So the sample complexity is just terrible. So you try to optimize, you t- to learn a function, you might be learning a function that is really specific. And in fact, the, the best thing to, to, to see this is that sometimes people apply these to computer games. And then, let's say, in the computer game, there's a bug. If you do a particular movement, the, the computer glitches, so you gain reward, for example. And you can learn such a thing. And that's a very glitch-based thing. If you perturb, if you change, if you correct that glitch, normal person wouldn't even notice, right? You perturb a little bit. So you might be literally cornering yourself to get a, a, a, a let's say, a value function or a Q function, a, a value network, for example. That will not work in reality, right? So the, the examples that I was trying to show here, as I must admit that as my battery I noticed was running out, um, um, I didn't have a chance to show. So here. If you look at this uh, Mujoko environment, you change the relative mass of these, let's say, half cheetah, right? So you train with mass one. In test time, you apply a different mass. You see that the algorithms go down, right? So like quite quite a bit. So this is a TD3. I, I also, uh, uh, sorry, this is DDPG. I also have the, the uh, TD3 experiments in the paper. You need to be able to understand that, you know, like your your um, the, the the value function that you learn understands that little perturbations, for example, should not cause you too much trouble. So you're not like completely exploiting a particular single thing. You're a bit more holistic. So you set up a mini max problem. It's it gets into this particular problem realm that I I try to explain. It's it's a um, It's a non-convex, non-concave problem with stochastic oracles. And these are hard. Uh, these are very hard. So, and in fact, it is uh, keypad complete. Kostis uh, Daskalakis um, just did a presentation uh, two weeks ago that they proved that it is keypad hard. So it is it's like you can't solve these problems. 
Uh, but this never prevented people from trying again, maybe identifying some of the assumptions that would make it work. But what we found is that, like, even you take a bilinear problem, right, which is convex, concave, problem is super good. We add an epsilon small perturbation to the problem, and then the algorithms will not work. So it's it's it's it's challenging. I think that maybe again. Uh, some hope can be found by the practitioners trying different tricks, finding different models or algorithms or heuristics that work, and we try to understand the assumptions that lead us there. For robust reinforcement learning, I think that what we've been doing, which gave me, which got me the Google Faculty Award, for example, this mixed mesh idea, which is opposed to fixing your value function, you think about a distribution over the value functions, right? So you learn a distribution, you learn more than one policy, and then in runtime, you are a bit more robust. So there are three tricks that you can do. Um, but I, yeah, I think this, this basically warrants his own presentation, which is a very, very, very big topic. Definitely. Uh, when you showed the minimax uh, problem and uh, I thought about GANs and you just actually opened the relevant slide, uh, it's surprising, right? It's uh, non-convex, non-concave. I mean, it doesn't really, the GAN framework, we really don't know if it's going to converge or not, but still we go ahead, optimize it alternatingly, min max, and we obtain some solutions. I have to really read your paper, <laughs> this one now, I'm really curious. I have to now let me uh, switch to some other questions. Uh, do you think that it is possible finding solutions for cancer, COVID, etc., by using reinforcement learning in the short term? <laughs> this is probably from a student, uh, by Kai Alan. Okay, the, uh, maybe, <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe just say a few so words. So there is Ellis, uh, European uh, Laboratories for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, so there's Ellis Network, where I'm a fellow. So there's a bunch of fellows that are really interested in this. It's a very serious problem, COVID. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Michele Schar at um, Oxford, not, I think she's also at UCLA. Uh, she worries about this problem quite a bit. Now, there are a variety of things that can be done um, trying to accelerate the design procedure, but you know, this is not just a problem for machine learning. There are all kinds of things involved. There's the ethics in terms of how to test. There's safety. Um, and whether or not the, the, the, the vaccine that you would find would generalize to other demographics, you know, like Asians versus you know, Turks mm -hmm. versus Europeans. Uh, I think that there's not a one-shot answer. I think that mm -hmm. by putting together like machine learning expertise, Mm -hmm. uh, with people that are doing drug design, vaccine trials, I think working together, just like what I was mentioning, getting the theory and practice together, I think talking to each other, showing the different perspectives, I think you should be able to do better. But of course, there's not a single bullet no. Um. Exactly, exactly. But by the way, I should say thanks to Berkay. I assumed he's a or he's student or so, uh, but thank you, Berkay, for the question. Now, another question. Do you think AI and ML can help us to understand nonlinear systems better, such as fluid dynamics? Oh, yeah. Actually, yes. Um, so... If you think about it, for many of the fluid dynamics, PDEs are useful, right? Partial differential equations, and this is like you can simulate with your whatever multipole method or something like this, you know? But then if you think about it, what the PDE does is that there is an input, and then it will give you a, a state or a, a, a time series of states, right? And this is a function. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. did we talk about? You can learn any function, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So what is interesting is that lately people have been really focusing on designing neural networks to um, learn solutions. Because like the fluid dynamics, for example, um, or weather, for example, right? So, so this is something that we did in, our, in one of our papers. It's compressible. Like you, you, can, you can look at these pictures. You can, for example, take a, a vortex, for example, you can compress just using matrix factorization, low rank matrix factorization, you'll, you won't see the difference. 
So clearly the data lives in a much lower dimensional data manifold. manifold. So like numerically doing this with the PDE modeling may not be as efficient as learning this input to output pairings directly. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there you can also use models in terms of, you know, improving your robustness and stability, correcting your model, uh, improving your generalization. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, you know, the sky is the limit. These three pillars that I mentioned, you know, things like regression, for example, you know, this is, this is a good regression problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bas, probably you need, we need to learn to uh, sweep the parameter space of these family of differential equations, right, in a more efficient way. Otherwise, uh, when we use networks for the solutions, uh, it's it's not currently for a family of PDEs, right? For instance, I mean, people think it's, it's for like the each equation, for example, right? So, yeah. um, I mean, they the poker plank equation. So these things okay. people fix, and then they try to learn a network that does this. I mean, is yeah, there a reason yeah. why we should have like a general one neural network to rule them all? I'm not sure. That might be interesting for sure. Uh, but parameters change the PD effect of the, the PD. Input, right? Yeah. That's the point. The input. Yeah. But if yeah. you think about it, you know, like a neural network also takes variety of inputs, you know, like, of like of add pictures, you know, like each picture is different from each other. But and you the have to then solve it for, a, you know, maybe infinitely many number of parameters. But this is a long discussion, of course. <laughs> this is, but thank you, Volkan. Other questions then? Let's see. Uh, what do you think uh, about the future of deep RL? Uh, this ties to also, I think this uh, my student is asking if you recommend working on it or not in the future. And another probably student, adding more layers to the network makes the solution space more convex. Uh, this uh, person remembers. However, RL researchers tend to use generally smaller networks. Is it a rule of thumb or just because of hardware limits? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there, there are a variety of reasons why you want to use a smaller network, right? Uh, I think the this, this sample efficiency, if you're doing model-free, it is it is important um, because the problem is already just like computational too much. With regards to the question, should we do deep RL? Uh, if you're at Google or, you know, DeepMind, yeah, you know, just talk to Thailand, uh, Jengil. Um, or Chalar there, right? So they will, they will, uh, like Chalar just released a, a package for RL, for example. They are in Canada, right? No, no, no, London. No, no, London, okay. because this question is more like um, in Europe, there are not many researchers working on this topic. Oh, Why not? Deep mind, that, no? deep, deep mind. Deep mind is <laughs> in Europe, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, it is difficult as an academician, though, because what you need is. I don't know, maybe a DGX server or something. You know, you want to have like a highly interconnected 800 uh, NVIDIA GPUs, which yeah. know, cost like 10,000 francs a piece, you know? Uh -huh. So uh, it is difficult, I must say, that so the RL research is actually challenging. So there is like a high entry barrier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's it's it's in a very similar to like some of these fancy optics lab or nano labs and so on and so forth, right? So you need to have some sort of a strong equipment to be able to demonstrate some of these ideas. Now there's the theoretical RL community, right? Like Gergen uh, Neu, for example, is, is is one guy. Chaba is, is another guy. Mm -hmm. So there you try to set up problems in terms of linear programming look at their optimality, duality gap. There are certain things that can be done there. Yeah, Volkan, uh, actually, in E2, we also have a very good RL lab. Uh, one of our colleagues at E2 AI, uh, okay. Kemal Ure, Nazım Kemal Ure. Okay. I think I should really introduce you guys. <laughs> so, uh, I might talk, know Kemal, actually. Uh, probably, yeah. We should have a separate session. Uh, another, uh, my colleague, Altan uh, Çakıroca, is asking, what is your opinion about AI and artificial general intelligence in the near future? <laughs> To wrap uh, up, maybe, yeah, just, <laughs> uh. um, yeah, AGI, uh, I think 
it's an important target, um, but there's history there. Right? So like if you think about what people were doing, they were looking at some of these models, multi-index models, they became uh, perceptron, then they became neural network, multi-layer networks now are called deep learning. Um, so it is very difficult to, because it has this connotation of deep thought, you know? And people think that, oh, you know, we're almost there. Because if you look at the demonstration, for example, in StarCraft, what you have is a bunch of valley networks, a pointer network that is pointing to all of these things with different agents, different actions, and then on the fly determining an importance and then choosing a particular thing and updating an architecture that will work only for that problem. In terms of Go, for example, you model it in a... A, a, a search tree, and then you learn um, this Monte Carlo tree search that efficiently prunes so that you can take steps. Right? These are important building blocks for intelligence, for sure. Now, putting all of this together, it, it is, I, mean, I would love another it. Another story. Happens, right? But another it, story. it yeah. is another story. Like, if you realize, the moment you realize, for example, this GPT-3 model, you know, it takes, I don't know, $3 million to train this model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it is impressive. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a huge carbon footprint, but it's not as efficient as our brain, you know? Yeah. That's so, another issue, right? Carbon print energy of uh, these uh, yeah, sure. deep neural networks are really sucking. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I so, mean, what they're so trying to do is they're trying to make sure that the future is is not good for humans, but good for machines, you know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there are many uh, movies about that we can talk about later. So now a uh, few questions left from students. Uh, for instance, one is asking to learn non-convex optimization, or do you have video lectures? And one of the other ones is This asking, year, yes. Yes, you will. Uh, you put them online. Yeah, so, and another yeah. one is Asking what are requirements that you demand from a prospective undergraduate student as a summer intern in your lab? Maybe they can send you emails, right? Or send your lab emails about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can probably wrap it up. Is that okay? They should probably send you emails, right? Or Yeah, maybe my admin, yeah. Okay, okay, to your admin. All right. So... Türkçe'ye dönebilirim. <gülüyor> Bağırıyorum. Bu çok ibrit oldu. Ee, ama e, şey yani, yok, yok, çok, çok güzel oldu. Ee, Volkan çok gerçekten e, keyif aldık. Ee, umuyorum dinleyiciler de eminim aynı şekilde. Ben göremiyorum şu an YouTube e, eko yapmasın diye açmadım ama tekrar e, çok teşekkür ediyorum sana. E, ağzına sağlık, evet. eline sağlık. Dinleyicilerimize de aynı şekilde. E, önümüzdeki dönemlerde inşallah tekrar bir söyleşide görüşmek üzere. Belki yüz yüze yaparız. İTÜ'ye bekleriz. İTÜ AI ile birlikte e, bir şekilde ilişkilendirmek de isteriz. Gerçekten çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Teşekkürler Gözde. Sağ olun. Çok, çok sağ olasın. Görüşmek üzere. İyi günler. İyi günler.